welcome to Living One. My name is Olivia Crossman. I am your host. Living One is a monthly webinar series in which presenters from around the world share their vision for a future where all Earth beings live as community in peace, dignity, and freedom. We ask the question, we know what's wrong, but what does right look like? This last fall marks the beginning of Living One's fourth year, but today these conversations are more important than ever. For they are more than conversations, they are opportunities to build community, solve for the isolating wounds of our time. Today we have the fourth and final session of our summer series, Veganism at the Crossroads of Human Identity and Cultural Change. This series will explore the deep reappraisal of human identity and culture for which veganism asks. Over this next week, our speakers will reflect on the issues and questions at this critical cusp in the evolution of human consciousness as our species moves towards what we refer to as nature consciousness. We are delighted to have you join us as we explore this important topic together. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are all currently on various different indig indigenous lands. I am currently on the ancestral homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, which includes the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. This land exists also as a place of trade with other indigenous communities, including the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Menominee, Sauk, and Meskwaki. The Krulo Center for Nonviolence, located in Southern Oregon, is also the homelands of the Grizzly Bear, Tacoma, Daku Bedete, Coyote, Coho Salmon, Golden Eagle, and Gray Wolf. To recognize the land is to recognize the lasting effects of colonization, genocide, and oppression that still impact indigenous communities today but it is also an expression of gratitude and appreciation for the land and for all those whose homelands we live and work on. In the last of this four-part series, we welcome Tom Harris. Tom is an internationally acclaimed artist, published author, and social justice activist. He is an expert and consultant on animal liberation history and strategy and the global anti-vivisection movement. Before we begin, let me share a few logistical notes. Tom will be speaking for about 45 minutes, which, and after which we will have 15 minutes for question and answer. In order to proceed in a timely manner, we ask that you please send your questions along in the chat during Tom's presentation, and we will read them out after he is finished. For anyone who isn't familiar with the Zoom chat function, if you move your cursor towards the bottom of your screen, you will see a number of icons appear, one of which is the chat function towards the center left of your screen. If you click on that, the chat will appear where you can type any questions or comments as we go. We do have two members of our Krulos community here with us today, Jenny and Deeksha, who will be monitoring the chat throughout our time here together. Also, please note that the Zoom session will be recorded, so if you would feel more comfortable leaving your camera off or changing your Zoom name, please feel free to do so. Finally, we ask that unless you're currently speaking, you keep your microphone muted to avoid any unintended interruptions. So without further ado, we welcome Tom Harris. Hello. Hi, Tom. Um, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's great to have you here. It's lovely to be here. So to start us off, do you want to tell us a little bit about your art, your background as an activist, um, and specifically how your animal liberation activism intersected with anti-capitalism? Yes, of course. Um, so... I think, I mean, for me, I got involved in animal liberation and anti-capitalist activism around the same time. So when I was like an early teenager, mm -hmm. I think really through the punk scene and the, the hardcore straight edge scene, I kind of came across both concepts fairly simultaneously. So I think for me, it would be hard for me to pick the two apart, I think, mm -hmm. because to me, one is very much symbiotic of the other. Um, but my involvement I, I i think i was drawn to animal liberation activism more than any of the other very necessary and um active causes firstly because at the time it was probably certainly in the uk the largest and most active movement mm. uh, and also i think i was drawn to the fact that the people i was defending were unable to defend themselves they, they needed a champion and they needed someone that could come in and try to help them so so i think that's what drew me to animal liberation but yeah that, like as i say to me all of it is combined anti-capitalism but also um the rights for for all justice for for humans and non-human animals and the, the planet and the environment uh i got involved 
in campaigning as i say it, it was really through the i say the punk scene there wasn't a scene where i grew up it was just me and my brother but it was a very small town and uh we read a, an article about uh actually the some kids in america straight edge kids in america that were rescuing animals from laboratories and things like that and even though you know this was before the internet was a big thing and uh, it seemed like a world away for me and i had a very romanticized image of, of what that all meant and you know dumps to dive in and jumping trains and protesting and rescuing animals by night and that really spoke to me as as a 13 year old that 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 was kind of who i was and and it was so far removed from what my friends were doing at school and and everything but it, it just really spoke to my soul i suppose mm -hmm. so um so me and my brother we we very quickly started getting magazines anything we could get our hands on and and reading about about the animal liberation movement and, and trying to work out what we could do so i think yeah i was probably about 13 or 14 and I remember sitting in a tree overlooking a, a fur farm with some binoculars and uh, camouflage clothing on and um, not really knowing what we were, we were doing. We were, we were basically children just trying to work out what to do. But uh, And at some point I realised it was the middle of winter, so there was no leaves on the tree and everyone in the farm could clearly see us sat there with our binoculars <laughs> on. So we, we aborted the mission and, and went off and did something else. But um, I think for me, because I became involved very autonomously because i grew up in a small town where there was there was no movement and there was no scene um so i was learning from what i could get from magazines and fanzines and album covers and crime think books anything i could i could get hold of and and so it was a very autonomous thing for me that i kind of dictated my own actions and mm -hmm. i suppose that tied in with the anarchism and the, and the anti-capitalism and and so so yeah, so for me, I've always been very self-determined in, in my activism and mm -hmm. uh, and even when I've been involved in other groups, I tend to kind of take my own kind of thoughts on, on how best to, to do things uh, and, and everything. Uh, I was probably, I think I was 16 when I first went hunt sabbing, um, which I presume is kind of a thing in America. I presume you, you sab hunts, but basically like going out and trying to stop the fox hunting here. Uh, so I was 16 when I started doing that. And that was when I first met other activists and, and hunt saboteurs and and really had people around me that I could discuss the, these ideas with and mm. really kind of strengthen and build who I was as a person and, and what, what these ideas meant to me. And I think from that point, I kind of became more and more immersed in, in a movement and a movement of like minded people. And and really that the movement I grew up in, the animal rights movement here at the time was overtly anti-capitalist. And mm. we did, we, you know, we we shared our food, we shared our money, we we would help each other out if we needed like bus fare or, or whatever we needed. We would go dumpster diving and shoplifting or we, whatever we had to do to kind of to do what we felt we needed to do. And I think, yeah, it was very empowering, I think, for me. And I think I'm always very grateful that I kind of found my way into all this at a young age because I think it allowed me to, I guess, a level of critical thought that a lot of people maybe don't have the opportunity to have because, mm -hmm. because I was able to separate from society in a way at quite a young age. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so, so yeah, I grew up through the movement like that and became heavily involved. Animal liberation became my life essentially um, for 10 years. Mm. Uh, I I ran a number of campaigns over over here uh, with my partner and, and some friends, and so we convinced the British Navy to stop using goats in deep diving experiments. Um, we closed down puppy farms and battery farms. Um, uh, we exposed illegal cosmetic testing of Botox over here, which was supposed to be illegal and was still happening uh, on animals and. Yeah, so so we ran it ran a lot of campaigns. Um, I also got inv heavily involved in the campaign that some people might remember, the Stop Hunting and Animal Cruelty campaign or Shack, which kind of spanned the world. I think we were active on every inhabited continent on Earth at, at one mm. point. So um, so it was a huge campaign at the time, and again, it really kind of sang to me. It was um, it was a very um, I guess no nonsense campaign. Is a good way of describing it. Um, we kind of had a very clear goal that was to close Europe's largest animal testing laboratory, mm -hmm. and 
the the structuring of the movement or the campaign that appealed to me too and there, there was i suppose like a central nexus of it all there was like a like an office that was essentially someone's front room but there was there was like an office where a lot of the research was done and the website and newsletter were maintained from but the structure of the animal rights movement in the uk at the time it was local groups so every town or city would really have their own local group who would mm -hmm. primarily focus on local campaigns so maybe they'd have a, a greyhound track or an abattoir or a laboratory or fur shops they, they would have their own local campaigns that they focused on but um then they would also support the larger campaigns when necessary so they might do an outreach tool for for one group or they might do a protest or they would go and attend a large protest with with some of the larger groups and yeah it was i think it was a very a very good structure and i think we've lost that a lot over recent years which is a shame i think i think there's a lot to be said for it but it led to a, a lot of autonomy so different local groups would have very different structures and very different ways of uh manifesting the, their protest which which i always found a positive thing that kind of diversity of tactics i've, I've always yeah. advocated for a, a wide diversity of tactics mm. uh, and support of other people choosing their own tactics um and so so yes yeah, so i became heavily involved locally in, in the shack campaign and then i um i went to university at a time when over here at least we had a seemingly progressive government although i quickly found out that wasn't the case but university wasn't wildly expensive so i kind of thought it was a good way to not have a job for three years essentially <laughs> so i um i went to uni but before i went to university i took a year out and went and moved in with the the shack campaign and mm. and helped run it full time for a year uh then went to university for i think i'd managed a year and a half before i realized i could not go to university and not have a job so i i did that and i quit university and then became full-time in, involved in um, uh, running my own campaigns, the ones I, I mentioned earlier, uh, and still supporting the, the Shack campaign, which has always been close to me. Uh, unfortunately, um, I'm sure maybe we'll get more into this later, but we essentially, the, the short version is we upset the wrong politician mm -hmm. and um, he devoted himself to ending us and silencing us, which again, unfortunately, he was very successful in doing. and. Um, I was arrested along with 30 of my friends and um, over a series of, of show trials, we were sent to prison for a conspiracy that didn't actually exist and based on evidence that had largely been planted by a, a police informant. And yeah, so I ended up getting a five year prison sentence and yeah, and now I, I'm out and I'm um, still doing what I'm doing. And, and in terms, like I say, with the anti-capitalism side of things for me, I never threw myself so much into actively campaigning for that as mm -hmm. much as I, mean, I have attended protests over the years and everything, but it's never been my focus because animal liberation was. But I think, as I say to me, um, like the civil rights campaigns, suffrage campaigns, the, the liberation campaigns and uh, environmental campaigns and the anti capitalist like, all of it to me, like I couldn't pull it apart. And, and as I say, I literally only picked animal liberation i think because at the time it was so active and there and this is this is probably a weird thing to say but we had a lot of prisoners in the uk mm. when i got involved for animal liberation and that actually appealed to me because i could see how people were fighting like people were putting their freedom and often their lives on the line for this and that was something at the time i wasn't seeing so much in other movements and, mm -hmm. and weirdly the idea that i might go to jail for it made me realize you know like people are, are sacrificing for this and and as i said earlier remarkably to me with this movement like none of us we're not fighting for ourselves we're not fighting for our own rights if we all just walked away from non-human animals except like externally at least none of us would suffer from that none, none of us would lose out obviously i'm sure psychologically we would but in in real terms we wouldn't and so we're we're making people were making these ultimate sacrifices for something they had no benefit from they had mm -hmm. they, they weren't improving their own lives they weren't gaining their rights or their freedom or their justice they were doing this for for others and yeah that 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 was a powerful thing for me and that mm -hmm. that's what drew me to that absolutely
Wow, that's that's so interesting. And and what a what a powerful arc you started so young and just to hear how the different segments of campaigns and, and your work has woven through is incredible. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your experience? You were talking about that phase where you um, left university and started full time with Shaq. What was what did that look like for you? I mean, what kind of things were you guys working on and what were you what was the activism centered around at the time? So it was the other way. So I, I was full time in Shaq for a year. Then I went to university and then I left quit university and started my own campaigns. But, Got it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the full time with, with Shaq, it was <laughs> It was a weird thing. I should say, in case I forget to plug it later, like I have written a book on the history of Shaq from start to finish. Um, it's I obviously I'm, I'm biased, but the reason I wrote it is obviously it's very personal to me, and obviously I'm very tied up in the events. But it's a remark, like genuinely a remarkable story. And when I was interviewed, there was a lot of things I didn't know, even though I was kind of at the core of it for so long. But you know, there's there's police chases and there's like people being handcuffed to toilets on bullet trains in Japan and there's uh, liberations and underground tunnels and uh, all kinds of wild stuff and then this uh, really like bizarre and sinister government conspiracy behind it all that, that I think people should read obviously because I wrote the book but really there's so many lessons to be drawn from it and there's you know, there, there's mistakes we made and there's things we didn't see happening that, that later happened that I see some of it repeating. I mean, I've seen some of it repeated already, but I also, as things are, I can see some of these mistakes being made again and, and some mm. of the lessons not being learned. And I think I think it's an important read for any progressive activist to kind of see how they can apply. Yeah. So the book is out in spring next year. It's called Your Neighbor Kills Puppies and it will be available on Pluto Press and hopefully widely, widely available. Um, so... <laughs> Back back to what you asked. Um, so doing Shaq full time and yeah, it, it was it was a crazy time doing doing animal rights full time. Um because it was 24-7. And I think there the Shaq had three founders who were really the core of the campaign. And and one of them in particular, a guy called Greg, he I think I mean, it may even be an understatement to call him a genius. Like a tactical genius certainly and mm. and his research and his um deep diving knowledge of, of business and how businesses work um really i think i mean it, it was remarkable to see and remarkable to talk to him because he i remember there was an interview with the guardian newspaper and, and they interviewed him and they said talking to greg was seeing and in, walking inside the mind of the activists of the future and I think I think that was a fairly prescient comment to be honest, and fairly on the nose because, yeah, he was really driven and and really just this was everything to him, and it, and for him it was we win or we lose. There's no like incremental steps. This like we either close them or we lose. Yeah, and he was so driven, and I think because of that, I think he, he expected everyone around him to be as driven as he was, which we all were. But obviously for some people like waking up at five o'clock every morning and and then not getting to sleep until one in the morning isn't especially when I was 18 like that, <laughs> that was hard and yeah often he would wake me up with an air horn at the end of my bed and be like it's time to go and do an outreach tool or, or whatever <laughs> do. but I think with Shaq it was it was an interesting thing and I think for those who know about the campaign I think I think sections of it kind of get remembered and sections of it kind of get glamorized and, and repeated and and those are the kind, you know, the the direct action side of it and the, you know, the office occupations and the home protests and the the lock-ons and and all those kind of things. But actually, like a bulk of what we did was outreach tools. It was encouraging people to write to their politicians and sign. I think we had the largest petition in British history at the time. I think we had wow. we had it in, I believe, two million signatures. But wow. when we were all arrested, the police actually confiscated several million more signatures and destroyed them. Um, so we actually had like, yeah, I think the biggest at the time, the biggest petition in British history. Um, and so, yeah, so there was a lot of outreachy kind of things and encouraging people to do bake sales or or whatever. So so it was it was a weird kind of mixture of, of things we would do. So, yeah, a lot of it was going out. And again, it was before the Internet really took off. So. We would go out with our pasting tables with leaflets and petitions and, and encourage people to come and find out and 
that was the social media of the time, I suppose, like face to face communication. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to pretend I don't miss that. Um, <laughs> and and then I had help designing leaflets, designing a newsletter, updating the website. I think I redesigned the website a couple of times. Um, and this was a big thing for me, actually, in my kind of evolution as an activist is being in that environment where if we needed a new website, we didn't have someone we could go and ask. We didn't have like back then there weren't like movement donors or, or anything like that. If we needed things, we had to skill up and learn how to do it. So, so yeah, very quickly, I learned how to do graphic design. I learned how to do web design and web, web development and um, yeah, how to organize protests and like all, everything, anything that how to do accounts, how like all of it, like we had to kind of learn and we'd be talking to solicitors about disclaimers one day and then like, running into an office the next day and uh, and then sometimes we'd go to Europe and do like protests because their laws were like a bit more lax and mm -hmm. yeah so it was it was a lot and it was it was amazing and I, I think it, it certainly like I, I certainly felt, felt very comfortable in myself at the time I think I think I felt like I was where I was meant to be. Mm. Beautiful. And would you say, so I know you're also a, an artist and a tattoo artist. Was, was that the case for you before doing all of this work with graphic design and web development and these artistic endeavors with Shaq? Or was that where this started? So when I was 13, almost directly before I fell into the slippery slope of, of activism, I when I started getting into punk music, I would look at the you know pictures of my favorite bands and they were all fairly heavily tattooed mm -hmm. and i as a child i was like i just want to hang out with these people i want these people to be my friends but i have no musical even for a punk band i have no musical ability i like <laughs> i have like yeah i can't even be in a punk band so but i could kind of draw so as a as a young teenager i was like well maybe if i became a tattoo artist then i could just tattoo these people and, and get into their circle that way <laughs> uh, so, so that was kind of my dream as a child and and then I got distracted by by life and, and fighting for life so um so it kind of very much went on a back burner really and I've always enjoyed drawing but I mean I was I was never great at it I just kind of enjoyed it but I think certainly like the activism like has helped fuel my creativity in terms of design yeah. and layout and things and um but creating design on the computer is obviously different from actually drawing things. When I was in prison, I spent a bit of time drawing and people started commissioning me to draw like little Spider-Man greetings cards for their children and things. Um, and that kind of sparked, like reignited it a bit, I think. And then when I was released from prison, I had two and a half years where I wasn't allowed on protest. I wasn't allowed to talk to my friends. I couldn't. I, so I, I was kind of, and like for the first year I wasn't allowed on the internet at all and like they you know they tried to ban me from talking to my brother because he's an activist and um so I, I was kind of in a situation where like suddenly like somehow I got to 30 and for the first time in my life I actually really needed a job mm. um I was stuck in a bail hostel with like sex offenders and and it was, it was horrible I'd spent seven months in there and I just wanted to not be there as much as I could and yeah. I walked past a local tattoo studio where and it just happened like by complete coincidence one of my friends from college happened to be working in that shop like just shop management and he said you know you can come and sit in here and draw all day rather than being at the, the bail hostel so I ended up sitting there drawing every day and kind of yeah for a year I just drew every day and so I was able to kind of work myself into getting an apprenticeship and, and it kind of took off from there I would say when I started I had no idea that how much of a full-time job it is because it's constantly like you know like prepping and and designing the clients and flash designs and merchandise and then just trying to improve my art and so it is, it's a lot more, more, more intense than I thought I thought it'd be a good kind of thing to do until I got back into animal rights but it kind of yeah threw a curveball in my life to be honest but yeah it's, it's a fun job it's a weird job but it's a fun job <laughs> it sounds cool and now you can follow up with the punk fans of, of your childhood if you wanted to I, I haven't tattooed a single punk band yet. oh that's a shame <laughs> my dream is in shatters <laughs> <laughs> something to look forward to I guess <laughs> um so you were talking earlier about how the anti-capitalist activism that you've done and the animal rights, animal liberation activism has just been very interconnected. So 
do you want to tell us about a little bit of your thoughts about um, vegan capitalism and the kind of rise of that? And how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think um, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit on that yeah. because um, I think there was a question you asked me. I didn't actually answer that this is pertinent to and, <laughs> and it leads into this. So um, with with Shag, I think one of the things that made the campaign kind of remarkable and it was really led by Greg, this, this concept of really understanding, I guess it's like the art of war kind of thing, but it, it's really understanding the enemy, as it were. And mm -hmm. And in this case, it was big business. So what we did was rather than just protesting the laboratory, we would protest any company that they needed to survive, but that didn't need them. And mm -hmm. we would put most of our focus on, on those companies. And so that kind of built to a point. I mean, the reason the campaign started was because of a, an undercover investigation, which tanked their share price, essentially. And so we started with the shareholders of the, the laboratory. But as time went on, we kind of moved to their bankers, their insurers, their auditors, um, customers, suppliers. And but then it just ended up getting very technical. Like we would be protesting against their market makers. And unless there's anyone here that's very involved in financial business, I, I'm sure most people don't know what a market maker. I didn't know what a market maker was, but um it's to do with share price, shares holders and it's, uh, but, <laughs> but anyway we would, we would end up protesting these kind of secondary and tertiary kind of campaign targets uh, and we really as i said we really deep dived the city of london and, and wall street and and how businesses operate on a on a very kind of like technical level and I kind of found it fascinating. I even with my anti-capitalist, or maybe because of my anti-capitalist kind of background, I I found it fascinating that somehow at some point I realized I probably understood finance and business more than most people that work mm -hmm. in these businesses. <laughs> and and we were kind of manipulating stock markets. And we like, you know, we had hunting and life sciences. We, we got them kicked off a whole bunch of stock exchange, but they were due to list on the New York Stock Exchange. And they turned up in all their, obviously their suits and they had their fancy breakfast inside the, the stock exchange. Uh, the bell was about to ring to look to signal them being launched. And the CEO of the uh, New York Stock Exchange took them aside and was like, I'm sorry, we're not listing you because, because mm -hmm. of this campaign. And just suddenly we, because we understood like all these things, like what the, what the gray markets were, what the pink sheets were and, all, the, all these things like we were in such we, we were in this ragtag bunch of kind of misfits and anarchists and suddenly we, we were like manipulating this multinational company to to the point that they were on their knees and and as i like, wait a minute if we can do this to this company we can do this to any company we could do this to mcdonald's or cargo or or any company and um and there's a, a big part of the, the campaign in america was it was um targeted at their um one of their lenders uh, Stevens Inc and they were owned by this billionaire um very stereotypical billionaire to be honest in um, Little Rock in Arkansas and and he was very kind of brusque about about it all like oh this isn't an issue we don't care about these people in England mm. and then the campaign started against them and in a few months after saying we don't care like he was like yeah like we massively underestimated these activists and, we, and we're out and I think particularly for the American activists at the time, but before it was really seeing this bully boy billionaire who's never been confronted by anything in his life <laughs> and never had to stress about anything, suddenly having this realisation that the little people can be more powerful than him. Like it was a huge, I think, revelation for a lot of people. And I think a lot of people kind of clicked at that point that we do have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And if we choose to direct that power, we we really do, and, and we we can do a lot. And I, I so I think for me, my my anti capitalist activism, like I think I've always kind of hated it, and I think kind of ge generically hated the concept of capitalism and yeah, and and the, the way our kind of system is run. And but I kind of found myself at some point becoming weirdly fascinated by it because mm -hmm. I could technically apply that information to to sabotaging a part of it essentially yeah. um and realizing that yeah if it's all very well not liking capitalism mm -hmm. but if we 
truly understand it, there's so much there that we can take the power back and 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 kind of twist it. And I think I mean we saw it a while ago with the um oh, what was that thing that happened with the where people were like shortchanging the um the shares and stuff on um mm-hmm. I can't remember what it was, but it was just some weird thing where there some activists just decided I don't think they're activists, just people decided just to like tank someone's share price. And and again with the, the Twitter verified tick where people were like messing with the share prices by like mm-hmm. making fake Twitter accounts and <laughs> and so I, there is there's a lot there's a lot that can be done if we start to understand these things and start to unravel and unpick these things so that then leads me on to your actual question which is how do i view the rise of vegan capitalism <laughs> and, I, I did remember and so I, so when i got out of prison it was 20 end of 2012 so running into 2013 and from that background of, of studying and understanding these corporations, I I kind of had a, a weird habit of picking up the Financial Times when I saw it and reading the business section of the Times and thing, things like that that are very un-anarchist things to do. But um, <laughs> I found it kind of fascinating and I understand, like, understanding and, and seeing like trends and seeing seeing what's going on and who's investing in what and and stuff. So um, so I was doing that and I me and my partner noticed i think the first thing we noticed i think it was 2013 was that sainsbury's a big supermarket over here had partnered with the welcome trust who were a um uh, the welcome trust uh how do i describe that i don't really they're they're like they were certainly initially like a, a pharmaceutical kind of offshoot i guess like a charitable offshoot of the pharmaceutical industry so a lot about kind of funding research and things like that mm-hmm. and so it, in a way you know like Sainsbury's a super big supermarket where they're a big capitalist organization they're obviously my enemy uh the Wellcome Trust they're like a pharmaceutical fundraising organization so obviously they're my enemy um but then I read this thing and and they were combining their well essentially the Wellcome Trust were using Sainsbury's as a laboratory mm-hmm. to see if they could encourage people to buy more plant-based food mm. and this was this was the first thing i was really aware of the vegan capitalism stuff yeah and i found that fascinating like like why why are they doing this and obviously it was because of climate change it had nothing to do with animal ethics or or anything else or yeah, non-human ethics it was it was entirely about climate change but they were looking to see how they could drive a positive shift in, in consumer habits and so which is very conflicting to me because i don't like either of those groups of people but what they're doing <laughs> i believe really, was behind and so uh, some of what they were doing was putting plant-based food in the meat aisle mm. so that people that wouldn't go to the free from section or the, the vegetarian section would be exposed to these things and might be like oh i wonder if that works so that was one of their experiments another was changing all of the recipe cards in the supermarket to plant-based foods um and another was just changing the layout of the supermarket because obviously it's all very psychological of like impulse purchases and and where things are laid out it's all yeah scary <laughs> stuff but um so that's what they were doing and i was like that, that that's interesting and then following that i noticed a spate of very wealthy people um investing in plant-based foods um mm. some of the you know the, the bigger particularly the american brands and um or the u.s brands and um again i was like oh this this is an interesting thing and it and i remember discussing with my partner at the time like this is weird because for the first time i i'm seeing a conspiracy there is a conspiracy here but it's one that i think is amazing and it's, <laughs> it's a very conflicting thing because there was very clearly a manipulation to push people towards plant-based food um but great this isn't some weird sinister conspiracy that i'm <laughs> against this is obviously some people with a lot of power are recognizing the impact of climate change and and animal agriculture and how that that intersects and and they're trying to do something so so I found that all very fascinating. And I suppose from there, it just continued to build. And and then, there, you know, aside from those people, there are donors that fund a lot of the animal rights movement. And they certainly initiate a lot of things here, like Veganuary and Meat Food Mondays and a lot of the av- billboard advertising. Campaign. I think that was another thing. We noticed the billboard campaign, which mm. was about going vegan and plant-based, but there was no link to donate there was no like way to get involved it was literally just go vegan and it was it might have even been go vegan world that were doing it and it's like 
And we were like, that that's strange because whenever we've done advertising, we need to pay for it. Right. They're clearly not interested in making money back. They're not interested. Right. Someone is funding this. Yeah. And so we did notice there was a rise in that. Sorry, I got a sort of joke. Um, so we noticed a, 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 these, this kind of rise of this kind of very positive conspiracy, I suppose. And, yeah. um, and so what I find fascinating, and there is more to it. I did write an article in the, one of the Force of Vegan magazines, if anyone wants to find that article. Um, yeah. But what I found fascinating about it, I think, really, is that this rise in plant-based eating that we're seeing, like, and I, I don't know how it is in other countries. I've, I've seen like things in America that bit, seem a bit more negative, but certainly in the UK, like the change in the last 10 years is like mind blowing. Like I can't, I would struggle to find a veg, uh, a non-vegan option. Well, no, that's, that's a weird way of saying it. I would struggle to find a restaurant in the UK that doesn't have a vegan option. Oh yeah. And that like when I was a child and I was vegetarian, I went to like accidentally went to like a butcher's when I was nine and I went vegetarian. But when I was a kid and I went to, to any restaurant, I'd be lucky to get a vegetarian option. Mm -hmm. And now there's like a vegan options. I could go to a steakhouse and get a vegan option. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's mind blowing to me. And, and now yeah. we're seeing, you know, big companies, like one of our biggest butter and margarine companies has gone fully plant-based and they have like billboard adverts saying, you know, leave out the cow and, you know, they've almost become animal rights activists and it's it's really weird to me. But it's I think a big part of it is, and, and as anti-capitalist activists, I think we often lose sight of the fact that these corporations, they aren't they aren't just like these faceless buildings or like corporate logos. Like people yeah. are there running them. And so for like McDonald's, for example, again, when I was a younger activist, like they were just categorically the bad guys. Like they were like, there was nothing good about them. They were and arguably they're still isn't, but they, um, you know, they, they murdered animals by the billions. They exploited their, their workers. They were involved in environmental destruction. They like were union busters. They uh, exacerbated plastic pollution. Mm -hmm. they, they were like pesticide pollution. They were, you know, there, there was nothing good about them. Yeah, and there was and there was nothing in them that was even vegetarian. You couldn't even eat fries or drink a milkshake and have it vegetarian at the time. Right, and I think so. So we just kind of yeah. So we kind of viewed them entirely as the enemy. But the thing is, the CEOs of those companies, the directors, the executives, they <laughs> change. Like new people come on, and as the world is becoming, is leaning more towards plant based eating. Yeah we're seeing that happen and so in the UK a big thing that happened here for it there's a like a kind of bakery chain like they're very kind of I guess they deliberately target working class labourer kind of um yeah demographics and yeah. and so it's very cheap food it's very kind of junky grab it pasta uh sausage roll kind of kind of food and they made a really big thing of bringing out a vegan sausage roll because the owner, I think his daughter maybe encouraged him, but he tried veganuary here mm -hmm. and cut down the amount of meat he was eating. And it was like, he came up with, I don't know if it was like a drunk moment or what, but he decided that he was at some point going to make a vegan version of everything on their menu, which <laughs> hasn't happened yet. But they made a huge thing about bringing out this vegan sausage roll. And at the time, the idea of just being able to go into this kind of like <coughs> budget bakery yeah. on every single high street in the UK and get a vegan sausage roll was like huge. Yeah. And they did it. And we had, you know, right wing TV commentators like eating them and throwing them up on telly and, and all <laughs> kinds of stuff. And that, I mean, that kind of helped. But there's this huge. So like vegans were queuing for like half a mile around the block waiting for <laughs> Greg's to open and get the sausage rolls in. <laughs> and it had a huge impact. And and that was just because the CEO of that company decided that, that he wanted to go more vegan and therefore his company was going to go more vegan. Yeah. It's more plant-based. Um, and, and then there's, uh, you know, other companies here. So there's a company called Noor that make uh, stock and um, gravy kind of stuff. And the, again, the CEO, I think her daughter went vegan. So she's now committed mm -hmm. to making the entire company plant-based mm -hmm. at some point. And, 
and then a similar thing with Burger King. I think think one of their like top executives has gone plant based or or something, and they, and they've um, pledged like fifty percent of their menu to be plant based. And so I think yeah, like it's a weird thing to see. And as an anti capitalist, a fairly fervent anti capitalist, it's weird for me to watch these companies doing what I've been criticizing them for not doing and. Mm-hmm. Now I'm like, where, where does this? Are you going to become ethical? How does how does that work? <laughs> like, that doesn't work, does it? Um, so I don't think it does work. But um, <laughs> but it, it is a strange thing in that this mass, obviously, animal rights activists, animal liberationists have been advocating for plant based diets for or vegan diets for generations, like decades. And you know, we we have had an impact, and the the amount of the percentage of vegans has very slowly risen over the years. But really, this huge wave of it happening, that's not being initiated by grassroots activists, although we're certainly, if you'll pardon the expression, capitalizing on it. This is coming from the top down. This is capitalism. Capitalism isn't, capitalism isn't adapting to a rise in plant-based food. Like Capitalism is initiating and creating the demand for plant-based food. Mm. And yeah, it's a very weird situation to be in, I think. And it's one that I yeah. kind of morally struggle with a bit because I hate capitalism. I would rather have vegan capitalism than non-vegan capitalism, but I'd rather have no vegan capitalism at all. <laughs> um, but I also think like, if we want an end to the exploitation and oppression of, of non-human animals, then we need that to happen as quickly as possible because the animals on farms and abattoirs, laboratories, wherever they may be at this moment, us toppling capitalism and then replacing it with something better is really a pipe dream like i i believe it could happen but i can't see it happening anytime imminently and yeah. and so if, if we're to wait for that we're we are indirectly condemning like countless lives to to die and to suffer and i think it then raises a very weird moral dilemma for me of, of do we then encourage vegan capitalism in order to save as many lives as possible now? But then what is the byproduct of that? And that where does that leave us with, with other issues like yeah. land abuses and human rights abuses? So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very weird and murky area. But <laughs> yeah, vegan capitalism is a very conflicting issue to me. And yeah, that that <laughs> I don't know if that answers anything, but, but that, that's where I see it. And, and I think we have a lot to discuss around it and how how we we make sure that we harness it and, and make it beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned, you said something about uh, the the future of veganism and that you do you do see toppling capitalism as a dream, but maybe maybe a far off one. Do you think realistically that uh, what do you see as a vegan future that does or does not involve anti-capitalism i mean do you think that that's like inherent in a vegan future at this point or can you have one without the other i think if we're being very morbidly realistic Mm. i think life on our planet has a very finite future at this point and i think hopefully we will see a mass change to plant-based eating amongst other changes that will enable life to or at least some life to hopefully find a way through it and we will retain enough of our atmosphere and water to to be able to to chart some kind of path through it um i think if if there is a situation in which we are able to reverse the the issues that are currently facing our planet i think that has to be a plant-based one and so i think realistically i can see very much within the next 20 years that the vast majority of people will be eating at least predominantly plant-based food yeah whether like stuff like lab grown meat kind of has a part in that i don't know i kind of hope not but i don't know what's wrong with just a veggie burger to be honest but <laughs> um i think i think yeah I, I i think it's it's very tenable that within the next 20 years the vast majority of people will be at least predominantly plant-based yeah. um in terms of over the throne capitalism i i mean it's an interesting thing like capitalism hasn't existed that long and it is clearly a failed experiment. It, the the concept of perpetual growth and perpetual advancement, I suppose, if not exactly how I'd phrase it, I think, but I think that's how most capitalists would phrase it. But <clears throat> it's necessarily 
unsustainable you, you can't continue growing on a finite planet it's just yeah. ridiculous and I think people who advocate for it don't realize that and I, I think we're kind of I feel like again like because of my my criminal conviction there's a lot of places I can't go so my understanding of, of how things are in, in the certain other like western countries particularly is a little bit limited but um certainly in the UK I kind of feel like we're heading very rapidly towards a tipping point culturally mm. where we have like I mean the UK is a weird place like we we have a a feudal system essentially still that a lot of people don't realize we have yeah so we pretend we live in a democracy but then you look at a lot of the people in power and they're people that are only in power because of their parents or their their titles and their wealth so we wouldn't be voting for these people if we had a free and fair election like mm -hmm. we're given these people to pick from mm -hmm. and it is very feudal and i think the system we have is one and under capitalism one where the very wealthy scrape as much as they can from everyone else but the problem is and i think something they haven't really figured is if you scrape too hard and too deep you run out of things to take mm. and i think we're very rapidly hitting that point i think when we look at how like young people, most young people in the UK aren't even considering buying property anymore. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's beyond an unrealistic dream. And, and so you see, oh, you know, like older generations, like, oh, you just need to like work harder and and have less holidays and eat less avocado on toast. But people are eating avocado on toast and going on a holiday because what else would they save for? Like, why save for something they're never going to have? And I was talking to my customer today and, and she was exactly in this position. She was, she'd saved up for a, a house, but by the yeah. time she'd saved up what she'd been told she needed as a deposit, mm. mortgage had increased, house prices increased, and she suddenly needed another 10, 20 grand. Yeah. And she's like, by the time I save that, I'll have to save something else and right. I will never get there. So she right. was like, screw it. I'm just going to get tattooed instead. <laughs> <laughs> Good for me. Kind of sad right. for like the young generation, but I, I think we've hit that. And businesses like you know like high street businesses are closing like left right and center and that there is nothing left to take like landlords and the government and their cronies that they've they've taken everything at this point yeah. and the nhs is collapsing and so i think we're rapidly heading towards a point where where there has to be change yeah and how that manifests i don't know um i <laughs> i have my dreams of a of a um be for vendetta but um but <laughs> I, I don't know how it's gonna gonna manifest but i i think at some point enough will be enough yeah like we've had three prime ministers here with no elections and yeah like it's it's a weird setup here so um yeah yeah and so you mentioned you mentioned your dreams and the the slogan of of living one is what does right look like and we definitely we definitely know what what wrong is and how that shows up in the world today and do you want to tell us a little bit about about your vision for for a future that we would want to inhabit what does right look like to you i think i mean it's hard because i'm one person and i think i think my idea idea of right would would be a fairly collective effort so um but I suppose a sustainable number of human beings living in a sustainable manner would be my dream. I, I do wonder how long that would last. I wonder how inherent it is in humanity that we would revert back to where we are and yeah. how long that would take. I kind of hope that's not the case. I kind of hope that, that we could find a way to live sustainably and maybe after a, a major event like the ones we're facing, may, maybe that will convince us that we need to kind of slow and think and <laughs> and take things a bit more holistically with the planet and realize that actually we need this planet more than it needs us yeah um but i mean i i try day to day to to live within the capitalist system i i unfortunately live in but in a way that reflects the future i would like or the, the economy and, and the yeah. systems i'd like so so for me, I'd, I'd very much like to see more of an arts-based economy. I'd like to see um, um, public and and large donations and and investment in, in theatre and arts and and music. I would like to live in a, a sustainable economy and a, and a small community-based one. So if I need a new table, it's madness to me that I would 
pay a, a Swedish company to exploit some Chinese workers to make this shoddy thing that I still have to build myself. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a weird thing to me, like shipping things all around the world, just, and it's not even that good. Yeah. Um, and so I would much rather go to the guy down the road that, that makes tables. And <laughs> so I do try and invest in things like, like weird things. Like, you know, I, I, there's like a blacksmith that I use to make curtain rails and stuff for me because, you know, like I, 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 my job allows me to live comfortably and therefore I'd rather invest that in other people that are self-employed like me, that are creating like me and, and creating things in the way I'd like to see them created. Yeah. Um, because because if we don't invest in that if the people that are in a position to don't invest in that <coughs> then it dies then yeah the, the economy that i would like to see has no chance of coming back because that's what it is it's returning to obviously like you know we've learned things and, and we have new technologies and things and that's fine but really we need to stop where the industrial revolution started mm -hmm. and just take account of what's good and what's bad and and what what should we continue with what should we not continue with and you know that isn't necessarily like you know like like doing as the Amish do and and forsaking all, all technology but like it is um that idea of, of living in our communities and you know like building our own homes and and working together to furnish them and and community gardens and I mean that that's the future I'd like a much smaller human population and one where we work with our neighbors and communities mm, beautiful um that sounds <laughs> idyllic to me as well i mean what a lovely what a lovely future to have it and it definitely sounds right um do you think so you've talked you okay your vision for for the future sound like you said the arts-based economy and so much of what you were talking about is working together to like create a livable and sustainable future so as an artist and an activist, and you spoke a little bit about this earlier when, when you were talking about the origin of both of those things for you intersecting um, around 13, do you think that they've continued to inform each other over your life? Do you think like who you are as an activist relates to who you are as an artist, or maybe that they, that they inform each other or coordinate in some way? I think okay so my tattoos are very odd for an anti-capitalist because mm. most of my ca tattoos are based around pop culture so like Disney and Pokemon and things that are very <laughs> not anti-capitalist um <laughs> I don't pay them any money for them <laughs> but, but um yeah so 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 that's probably a bit odd in that I'm not I suppose di I do, but generally my my day to day job, I'm not channeling my activism through my art. I mm. do try to like intersect them, and I do you know I, I sometimes release art prints that do have that that lean on them. A lot of my own tattoos I have on me are very heavily <laughs> leaning towards the animal liberation motif mm. and other ideas around it. I think I think in my activism certainly there is a level of creativity that i like like to employ and and like writing the book is, is a creative act um, yeah. so there are ways i do try and do it i've just um launched a team of vegan tattoo artists and we're debuting at the vegan camp out event next mm -hmm. no this month jeez um so we're we're doing our first first event there so i'll actually be tattooing vegan tattoos on vegan people and cool. so i think i feel like that's a fairly positive thing and my intention is to to take information that i can radicalize people with and, and distribute to and help with that so um yeah that's um so th th there are intersections for sure and i think i do try and use it that way as much as i can um it is something I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I have a very chaotic ADHD mind. So I tend to kind of start a project and just like, well, and then another one. And so I've always got a whole load of projects going on at once. And <laughs> at some point when I'm able to kind of dial that down, I, I do want to do some more. And I want to throw me into some very specific oil paintings and, and things and and try and manifest my passion <laughs> through, through that. So it's a thing, I, yeah, I want to do more of for sure. But 
yeah. there is I mean I feel like everything I do intersects and, and yes I do draw things around all rights groups and I do and vegan tattoos when I can and and when I do if people message me for like a you know a specifically vegan or animal liberation tattoo I will always do it for a donation to a group that mm. I feel appropriate. Yeah, so yeah. I, I don't actually charge for them um so yeah so I, I do try and find ways to make insects and the art on me <laughs> And the art I love, the art hanging up in my studio and the art in my home is um, there's a lot of animal liberation themed pieces and, and other anarchist themed pieces. Yeah, very cool. And you said um, your book as as a recent creative project, were you a writer? Did you consider yourself a writer before writing the book? How did you, have you written, you mentioned articles and whatnot beforehand. And we can certainly, as a side note, if you want to send those, any that you think are relevant here or want to disperse, we can get those to everybody here today. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll find the link to the the article you read. I think the anti-capitalist one, I think is fairly pertinent to what we're discussing. But um, yeah, I think I've never considered myself as anything other than uh activist i think to be honest i think i've always i think that the background i had and the movement i grew up in and the way we kind of learn and taught ourselves and each other to to skill up when we need to do something i think it really instilled this idea in me that i can do anything <laughs> and i i came to the conclusion a while ago that i'm never going to be great at anything but mm -hmm. i can get pretty good at anything and <laughs> so far apart from singing i don't think i've been proved wrong um but maybe <laughs> other people may disagree but um modestly maybe um but so i think when i was like oh i'm gonna write a book i don't think it occurred to me that i couldn't be a writer sure um i have written i think three or four novels that like no one has read because they're clearly terrible or certainly no <laughs> one published because they're apparently terrible but um but in writing this i think it was um I found it a fairly straightforward process. I learned a lot along the way, and there's a lot of things that I wish I'd known at the beginning, but that I didn't. But um, I think because I was telling a history, I I thought I knew very well, and so, certainly something I was very passionate about. And deep diving, like the, again the ADHD thing, but deep diving the research into this stuff, like was a fascination and an obsession, really. And I was very lucky in that I started writing the first day of the first lockdown in the UK by complete wow. coincidence. And so then I wasn't allowed to work for eight months. So I had eight months where I could gather all this information and just like throw myself into, into this research. And so I think yeah. my book's got like, like a thousand citations in it or references oh, wow. in it. So um, yeah, like I, I wanted to make sure because it covers this fairly like almost unbelievable conspiracy. I wanted to make sure that there was nothing in it that could be questioned. So yeah. there are things that I knew happened that I haven't included because I can't prove they happened. And there's, sure. there's theories and ideas I have that I haven't included because I can't prove it. So, so everything that's in there is verifiable. And, and yeah, that was a big important thing for me. So I, you know, I interviewed over 50 people <clears throat> and I, you know, I reached out to undercover cops and their employers and, people wow. who train train them and wow yeah like yeah so i really deep dived in the freedom of information requests like dozens of them and um hundreds of newspaper articles and, and magazines and yeah trolling archived websites so yeah I, I really went went in on it and um <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i i think i found the, the process made sense to me so it didn't strike me as a thing i couldn't do yeah um, and now, yeah, now, I, now I'm a writer, apparently, because now I'm <laughs> asked to write other books and things by publishers. So that's um, fun. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. You, when you started the research process, like I imagine being so heavily involved in the, in the campaign to begin with, you knew a lot of the history. But was there, I mean, did you uncover things that even being involved in it, you didn't know? Yeah, I mean, there, there's things in my book and, and substantial things that I don't think anyone knows. I oh, mean, wow. Uh, certainly not animal, animal rights people. I think there's, from the government side, I was able to um, access some redacted documents from secret meetings that happened between the government and the pharmaceutical industry. Wow. Um, and they were redacted, but they they weren't redacted very well. And I, <laughs> whoever did it, I'm very grateful for. And I hope they haven't yeah. lost their job because it was very easy to unredact these documents. Uh. Um, 
<laughs> I won't go into too many details, but I was able to <laughs> to to read them in full. And um, so I've got, got yes yeah, conversations between the um, the Minister of Science and the pharmaceutical industry about how they were going to deal with us and and things. So um, I think the scale of the government conspiracy, I don't think anyone understood that. I think we gaslit ourselves a lot of the time that what happened was inevitable. Yeah. Um, and so go, doing this was very cathartic and it, it really opened my eyes to the depth of the conspiracy against us and the, the fact that whatever we did they were going to stop us and it really was just a matter of whether we close this laboratory before they closed us yeah. and and it's kind of fascinating the kind of the mirroring really of the tactics they used against us were the tactics we were using against the laboratory mm -hmm. but like a very perverse and distorted version of it yeah where where we were non-violent and where we were um you know we tried to remain within the law and we tried to do things in the way that, that we felt was ethical i suppose yeah <laughs> they took each of those tactics and really like perverted them and used them back against us which mm. is a fascinating thing i guess it shows how effective we were yeah um, but yeah and then from the uh, from the kind of ground level like the the grassroots activist side of things that uh, the kind of movement came in several stages so i've covered the genesis of the campaign so before our campaign there was a campaign against the a beagle breeder that bred dogs for testing, a cat breeder that bred cats for testing, uh, and then a campaign that preceded this one against the same laboratory. And so I've gone into the history of them, which I think a lot of the later activists wouldn't have known because that goes back to, um, I mean, really, the campaigns go back to like 1996. Um, mm. And obviously, people who were then involved in 2013, 2014 had no idea of that. They were like children or not even born, some of them then. Um, and then the campaign itself it was international so there's things that happened in different countries that people would have had no idea about but also yeah. um the three campaign founders they ran the campaign until 2007 <clears throat> so from 1999 to 2007 then they were arrested we were all arrested but they were remanded to prison and they were basically like they had all their access to their movement and the outside world really cut so from them, they believed that basically the movement had ended with them going to prison. But myself, my partner, some friends, we kind of got together and were like, we can't let this happen. So we took over coordinating the campaign from that point. Yeah. So the P and a lot of people obviously got scared. Like there's this mass roundup of people, 700 police officers with like multi million pound budgets, like busting into people's houses and, and arresting them, sometimes at gunpoint. And it was, it was a scary time and a lot of people were scared and left and yeah and so for the people that did either went to prison then or left then or had bail conditions that prevented them being involved they had no idea what happened for the next seven years they, they, a lot of them don't realize the campaign ran for another seven years <laughs> um some of them were in prison for all of those seven years um so then the people that came after that a lot of the movement after 2007 was new people that we kind of recruited some of them were like outraged by what happened but very few of them knew the history of why this had happened so yeah. one of my closest friends she really got involved not long before this all kicked off yeah. so she came into a movement where we were already heavily repressed like where they had injunctions preventing us from protesting most of the companies connected as laboratory um we had a new law that prevented us from interfering with the contractual relationships of an animal research organization um they had banned home protests they had banned office occupations they'd they'd basically like criminalized most of the protests we did here so my friend she got involved when doing a protest was a risky thing in itself just a peaceful yeah. regular handing out leaflets protest and so she would come to europe with us and where we could do more stuff but and then suddenly we all get arrested including her boyfriend who she had been dating for like i think six weeks or something oh jeez suddenly gets arrested and is banned from talking to her because she's an activist and 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 she was only a teacher she was 16 I think at the time so um she was like what the hell is going on and and a lot of people her generation the people that came after her they they had no idea of the <laughs> seven years that had led to this point yeah um so yeah so I think yeah there's there's these kind of generational gaps where like knowledge was lost and knowledge is missing and and it's nice to kind of put a cohesive arc on this and, and show people yeah. what happened. 
I think, like, for example, towards the end of the campaign, I won't, I won't give too many spoilers on the book, but towards <laughs> the end of the campaign, that's fine. Um, towards the end of the campaign, um, the laboratory were essentially forced into some very, like, bizarre financial maneuvers, essentially, to try and stay open. And um, we uncovered a lot of things, and we basically forced the CEO of the company to have to buy out the entire company of his shareholders. And I think most people involved in the campaign have no idea that all this happened yeah. after the main founders were arrested and sent to prison. So, um, right. yeah, there, there's a lot in it that um, is fascinating. And the fact there's a um, there was a quote, there's a, a former animal rights police officer was commissioned to do a report on animal rights activism before and after my friends went to prison. Mm. And, and essentially, like, you know, because when that happened, the, the laboratory were press releasing, this is over, everything's fine, like, it's sorted now. And the government and the FBI were aware, press releasing this. Um, and so he did this report and he came to the conclusion that activism actually intensified after <laughs> those arrests and those roundups. Um, so there was less actions, but they were more severe, I think. Yeah. Is, is word. Um, and and it's a, again, it's a, a fascinating piece of our history and and a lot of people just don't know. A lot of people had left the movement at that point. And even people that have come back since yeah. weren't there when this all happened and, and aren't aware of it. So, yeah, there's there's a lot in the book that I didn't know. Certainly when I was in prison, I, I had no, no one was sending me animal rights news. Right. I, I wasn't allowed to ask for it because I would get punished, but people could have sent it. But because mm. I wasn't asking for it, people assumed they couldn't. And so, um, so I was really like in suspended animation and I felt the movement must have ended. Yeah. So what happened after me, like, I was always a little bit bitter. And in some ways, I still am about some of it, but I was always a little bit bitter about the people that I perceived had just kind of abandoned us and abandoned the movement yeah. and, more importantly, abandoned the, the non-human animals. And um, and then I, I was re- interviewing pe- people and researching, and I was like, oh, like, people continue to sacrifice a lot. Like, people continue to go to prison after us. And and I had no idea. I had no idea of the, the amount of arrests that were happening and the, the amount of actions that were happening. So... Yeah, there's there's a lot I didn't know, and there's definitely a lot other people don't know in there. That's just it's incredible to hear how how dis disjointed the communication got when people were removed from certain aspects of the campaign, and that just that sounds like this book is going to be just like such a unifying among everybody who was in the movement or involved in the movement who missed these aspects that you're speaking of. Like, what a unifying force it, it sounds like it'll be I'm um that's that's very exciting and congratulations I'm sure we're all excited to read it <laughs> thank you I think also having this overarching history it actually everything makes a lot more sense things that felt very unusual at the time yeah tying it all together it's like oh sure. that's why that happened and yeah. this is why that happened and that led to this uh, everything kind of the timeline and everything it all makes so much more sense certainly to yeah. me and hopefully to the readers when they, they get hold of it absolutely absolutely oh well that's incredible i know we have quite a few questions in the chat so i'll start to read those out um but uh, amazing <laughs> what a conversation um can i ask a real quick question yes okay, go for yeah, it I, i'm being my abuse of doing this uh, Tom- <laughs> Um, you know, you mentioned about nonviolence and and talking about you know capitalism as a kind of a reality. Uh, if you look at like the you know tick the the top three, or <laughs> you don't have to be top three, but Thich Nhat Han, Martin Luther King, and Mahatma Gandhi, is that the, they're all contemplatives in one way, and they were all um, firm um, supporters and believers and lived nonviolence. And I think something that's key of that is. Um, they were grounded in a different reality. In other words, it, it it's it wasn't just a way of being, but it was really um, decoupling from any kind of traction point that capitalism can have. Can you kind of talk about that, or what what your thoughts are about that? Because I I mean I guess that's what I'm saying. I feel is that that that's the power of contemplative activism um, is that it. Uh, it is grounded, if you can call it grounded, it's grounded in the territory which in which capitalism cannot survive. And I just wanted to know what you thought about that. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's grounded in a different reality. It's like a, a reality where there's no oxygen for capitalism. 
I mean, I mean, yeah, you the two are like the antithesis of each other, aren't they? Like you, you can't have you can't have capitalism without oppression. Like it doesn't work. Like someone is being exploited, and and, and oppression is violent. So um, so yeah. So I I think a non capitalist world or world without capitalism. I mean, it's not that's not necessarily a non violent world, but you can't have a capitalist world that doesn't have violence. So I, I think if you remove violence, then you remove capitalism. Like you say, you start a bit of oxygen and it, and it can't exist because the only way you can have a billionaire, really, and I'm sure there are like a very tiny number of exceptions, but you can't really have a billionaire who hasn't been responsible for exploiting and oppressing vast numbers of people. Um, and that's essentially what capitalism is, isn't it? It's a, it's a system where where a very small number of people make as much capital as possible, and capital is the the thing that drives it. Also, capitalism like is centered around this idea that capital and wealth are the most important thing, which is why our laws in in the US and in the UK, like our laws, protect finance and money more than they protect individuals and. and personal autonomy so i think kind of yeah with with that kind of kind of angle with there there is no capitalism without violence and i think yeah i i feel like like my my view on on online violence is probably slightly slightly different and slightly misaligned but i i view myself as a non-violent activist i've never carried out what i would view as a violent act i'd never hurt another human being i'd never hurt another animal i'd never hurt the planet and and that's what I'm rooted in. And I, I don't think it's possible to live fully like that within a capitalist construct. I don't, everything we do within capitalism is necessarily hurting others. And I, I, I think in order to, to shed capitalism, yes, you have to shed violence. There's, there's no other way. We, we've it. been talking about sort of redefining non, non-violence um, as non-exploitation. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then again, you know, the, this notion of the contemplatives is that that is based in the term is non-dualism versus dualism. In other words, there's a difference. So capitalism requires um, a foundation and in a view of difference. I mean, yeah. there has to be a subject and an object. Otherwise, it doesn't function. Yeah. So thanks. Thank you. That's OK. But yeah, no, I, I agree completely. <laughs> Thank you, Gay. Um, Mary is wondering, um, is this explained in your book, Targeting Factory Farms in particular? I can't remember what that was in relation to back at that point, but um, if that's in terms of the pressure campaigning and things, the the book is a complete history of the campaign. So it's not like a how-to guide, but Mm -hmm. if you read the whole book, it it will give you ideas of, of what we did i think something i'm always a little wary of is telling people how they should campaign or how they should structure a campaign because mm-hmm. i think with the shack campaign there, there was like the shack model that was talked about a lot at the time of of how to do secondary and tertiary targeting and and you know targeting shareholders and all these kind of things but i think actually when we were running shack we weren't running to a model we were adapting to the situations we faced and and doing the actions and and picking our campaign targets for want of a better word uh based on what we felt would be most efficacious at the time so to just replicate that probably won't work and there was a lot of campaigns that did uh that were inspired by shack and and the shack model and the ones that were truly successful understood the broad concept of what we were doing and didn't necessarily try to replicate it exactly. But certainly in terms of um, targeting factory farms, if you, if you wanted to close close a factory farm, or was that relating to me closing factory farms in my group? But I mean, again, we, we did a similar thing in that, in that we, you know, we, we did these pressure campaigns and we um, um, we did close that. But so, so if that's the question, then no, that's not covered. But broadly, if you read the book, hopefully it will give you a good idea of how we applied our understanding, our knowledge, our expertise to to the situation at hand, and how we we found ways through it and around it, under it, over it, mm. and uh, 
yeah, how that could be affected. Great, great. I hope I answered that. Mary, if that wasn't um, an answer to your question or we misunderstood you at all, please feel free to unmute um, and clarify. You answered it well, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> great. <laughs> thank you for your question, Mary. Um, Brett says, I'm, I'm surprised as you are about the capitalist drive towards plant-based diet. As it is not for ethical or health reasons, what do you think is the main reason behind it? Ostensibly the climate change agenda, but it's unlikely to be the real driving force. Could it be that there's more profit to be made in it? I, I mean, I kind of disagree. I think it is the climate change agenda. Um, I think the reason I think that is because when I was, when I first started seeing about it, like that was explicitly the reason being given by by these people. And yeah, uh, and the well contrast, the Sainsbury's thing, which I think really was one of the, the triggers for it. That was expressly for that purpose. I, th I think, again, going back to what I said earlier, these big companies, despite the terrible things they do, they are run by human beings and they right. are managed by human beings and the decisions are, are carried out by human beings. And some of those human beings certainly don't regard themselves as terrible people. And some of them even regard themselves as good people that want to do the right thing. And, and some of them will be plant-based. Some of their families will be plant-based. And some of them will genuinely care about climate change, about their children's futures. So I, I think it's a very small number of people high up in the capitalist hierarchy, okay. uh, for sure. But I think those people are there that are trying to drive this. And it is for climate. It, like, as you say, I mean, it's, it's not about ethical or health reasons at all. It, it would never probably be that. But in terms of having a survivable planet for their children, there are people in all walks of life that recognize and are increasingly recognizing that if we want a planet, we have to do this. And I think there are a small number of people within these companies that that are doing that and and then it drives change so i mentioned earlier about the greg sausage roll phenomena in the uk and i didn't actually go into into the the fallout from that which is that most bakeries in the uk now sell vegan sausage rolls mm. because greg's did it and because suddenly there's oh there's a demand we need to keep up and in the town i live in where, where my new tattoo studio is we're, we're in what's called the vegan triangle locally and there's Unfortunately, one of the restaurants just closed, but I think we still have three fully vegan restaurants, a vegan supermarket and several vegetarian restaurants and a whole bunch of places that they cater for vegans just in a very, very small little triangular area. Um, and I don't mean like blocks. I mean, it's literally just a little triangle of grass <laughs> that is surrounded by vegan premises. And the reason that's escalated is because the companies around are like, oh, there's a market for that. I'm going to add some vegan options to my menu. Yeah. And so where, you know, none of the vegan restaurants are, are pizza places, but yeah. there are two pizza places in the triangle and both of them now have fairly substantive vegan pizza menu. And they're saying there's a flapple place that is almost fully vegan now. And there's a whole bunch of other places that, that are offering these things. And then you can get full English breakfast and Sunday roast and from just a tiny area of my town. And it's because some people have started selling the food. Some of these vegan restaurants started. In fact, ones that opened and then it's had this snowballing effect. So, so I think it is the climate agenda, climate change agenda, if that's the right phrase. But I think the amount of people that are initiating, this isn't like capitalism has got together and decided to do something good for once. Right. This is a handful of people who happen to be in strong positions at a handful of companies. Yeah. And then that is having a ripple out effect. Yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so interesting. Um, thank you, Brett, for, for your question. Um, Janet is wondering, what is the name of your most popular book? Um, well, it's going to be this one. I, <laughs> I think you said it in my thing. I'm a published author. I'm not yet a published author. I will be when this is published in the spring. Um, I do have more books that are due to be published, but but so far this will be my most popular book. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> uh, that was one copy. I'll be my most popular. Book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Janet. Isabella is wondering, what do you feel about the animals themselves? Do you feel a connection, a passion for them, or for the cause? I ask because I feel the passion for the animals and trees, etc. But my lack of commitment to cause has meant that I'm ineffectual. It seems to me that action is so much more important than feeling here. Um, ooh, 
I like this question. It's a very broad question as well. Well, certainly my answer, I feel, is going to be very broad. I think I feel that I don't know if I feel a spiritual connection. Maybe I'm too cynical for such things, but um, I certainly like have a wonder at nature, and I uh, I feel most free when I'm in nature. I I think when you know if you see an eagle or a buzzard soaring overhead, there's like a dopamine rush that that I'll never get tired of but and also when i see like i was having lunch at a pub a little while ago and there was a herd of deer next to us and and just seeing deer i mean we were in quite a rural town but seeing deer with, within a town and knowing that something you know in a country the size of the uk is as piddly as it is knowing that animals so large had somehow managed to survive us to this point like that fills me with genuine awe and wonder and you know seeing badgers and foxes like these larger animals that have somehow survived us like that fills me with absolute joy um i would much rather live in a world with only non-human animals in it but um so i i i i feel a connection to individuals i think i i have a rescue dog and and she is my child i don't care what anyone says she's my adopted child and um i see her for who she is i I see her. I could. I know when she's sad. I know when she's happy. She she has a weird hobby. She likes to climb trees, and sometimes <laughs> I need to help her. And and I see that in her. She has a hobby, and she loves it. And she'll be upset if I don't stop at a certain tree to help her up it. And you know, I see these emotions, these thought processes. I know when she's had a good day, when she's dreaming and and running, and and that. So I ha I have very deep connections to individuals. Um, yeah. And I certainly feel more connected to the rest of nature than I do to humanity yeah. um i think though for me i don't think it matters if people even like animals let alone feel connected to them or love them or, or whatever else i don't think it matters i think it's just about respect mm -hmm. like i don't have to like someone to not shoot them in their head and make them into a sandwich like right. it's kind of a it doesn't matter like you can be terrified of cats and still recognize that they shouldn't be violently oppressed though um so it's, so the question for me is, is as i answered it i think the question of, of how i i feel people should should regard animals i would very much like people to take a moment and just experience another animal's value to itself and its its place in this world and its capacity to think and feel i'm saying it and that's horrible i don't like saying it um their capacity to think and feel and 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 ultimately suffer but also feel joy and elation and and excitement and anticipation and and all of these things that that i think for way too long we viewed as human qualities and and they are like they're they're animals we're animals and, and non-human animals are animals and i think one of my big bugbears within our movement is is the amount of times i see people talking about humans and animals as if they're separate and and we're right. not we are animals and and it bothers me because when we use language like like that, it reinforces this idea that we are different. And that is the the exact point at which people start to feel justified in committing oppression because because of that. So so I, I very much recognize that I am an animal and um, that, that we all are and, and that there is not that much difference between my dog and, and I and a pig and a, a cow and a, a buzzard like like i'm sure we, we experience the world in different ways but but ultimately we all just want to live and and, and have some kind of quality of life mm. um and there was another so and the lack of commitment to the cause has meant you're ineffectual um i i think there is i think a very important thing about our movement all movements is that everyone has a part to play and I, I don't think I think very often we kind of like look at the kind of glamorous kind of sexy roles within it within a movement and I don't think that's right I, I think there is something that everyone can do and I think regardless of of your your own personal circumstances that there will be something you can do and it, it doesn't have to be something massive or dramatic or like you know you don't have to be scaling rooftops with banners or, or rescuing the animals from laboratories but but you know contacting people in power that might actually affect change 
can have a big impact and putting up stickers can be huge for, for recruiting other people like if you if you went out and put up a sticker that convinced someone else to join a group who then went on to do some incredible action then you you played a vital part in that action happening and so that there's very small things i feel that that everyone can do and i think it doesn't to me it doesn't necessarily matter what people are doing as long as it's as long as it's not perpetuating harm yeah i think the important thing is that we all try and do something whatever we feel that whatever we feel will be effective but also whatever we feel is within our means and within our power yeah brilliant <laughs> thank you as well for your question great question um Mike is wondering, how do we get away from defense spending and distributing the military budget into a sustainable li living budget, as you described? The military is a welfare system that needs to be redirected. Security will be found in sustainability, not continual confrontation. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, <laughs> honestly, like, it's, it's mad to be like, if I were running a country, I think I would switch it round so that i don't i'm sure you have similar things in in the usa but in the uk we have these i guess they're telethons i think that's what you call them over there where like people phone in fundraisers to yeah. um, the children in need or um comet relief we have over here and you know they will raise millions of pounds to like phone in in a night of events on telly i would switch it around and i would direct tax money towards those essential causes and I would have telephone fund fundraisers for military spending, prison, mm. industrial complex, uh, and see if people actually want to fund that stuff. Because yeah. I, don't I don't reckon the military would be that well funded if, if we did that. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a shame over here we had um, Jeremy Corbyn was, a, you know, an actual Labour leader who got absolutely vilified by our right wing press and forced away. I, I think he maybe here would have made some changes, but it's a hard thing i think um again capitalism is based on um <clears throat> a lot of it is muscle flexing and and stuff and and a lot of the military stuff is, is aimed at distracting us from what our governments are doing like we say like russia's doing something terrible go and look at what they're doing we have to go and stop it look we're we're sending the boys off to fight and actually we're not the same but wait a minute our government are sending protesters to prison our government are encouraging policies that are directly hurtful to, to immigration and yeah lgbtq plus people and yeah so I, I think i i don't know certainly under capitalist system i don't know how we stop it but to be honest like it's something i struggle with seeing how we, we stop anyway it should stop but i think a, a lot of attitudes need to change a lot of mindset needs to change and mm. yeah I, I don't know i wish yeah. i did I really wish i did <laughs> it's a good answer thank you mike uh for your question um allison Oh, Allison was saying goodbye as when they Bye. headed out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Everyone <laughs> close and to Tom. I have to go, unfortunately, but really great talk. Um, then, all right, hold on, scrolling. Uh, Jeanette did what I said I don't like. <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah. Jeanette. laughs> Humans are animals, so animals can't be better than humans. <laughs> human animals are better than humans. <laughs> um, that looks like oh isabella yes thank you what <laughs> go for it <laughs> hello hello tom um one of my one of my friends we both worked for anglia television at the time that the um that the confrontations at huntington life sciences were happening and i covered sport so i never covered any of it and um, one of my friends um, was often sent to to cover um, the demonstrations, and she was absolutely terrified because she was convinced that um, she would get <laughs> that she would get firebombed because she was a reporter and might be seen to be sort of like talking to Huntingdon Life Sciences. And I, I couldn't persuade her; <laughs> I could never actually persuade her that you know that she wasn't she wasn't uh, you know sort of like at threat. <laughs> And um, and I think that, you know, there is there is sort of so much um, of a sort of lack of understanding within the public. I mean, it happens now with Extinction Rebellion that people are so furious. Well, you know, they shouldn't stop at people's day out like um, this was this was an Extinction Rebellion, but an offshoot like at the Grand National. And it, it makes me it makes me sort of 
it makes me sort of so frustrated that sometimes direct action, which I think is incredibly powerful and as you've proven um, can be so effective is regarded by by sort of members of the public as so antithetical that it can actually turn them against a cause and um and and i sort of wonder if you know if within your book or within your increasing understanding of the um of the developments of of activism you've sort of addressed that issue um yeah it's it is a, f- a funny thing i am I actually tattooed someone recently that worked for one of the laboratories connected to hunting and life sciences. Um, and she was telling me, I mean, she's a lot younger than I, and she she wasn't around during the, the chat campaign, but she was telling me that the entire pharmaceutical sector in Cambridgeshire is terrified because these like crazy activists have just got out of prison and they did all this wacky stuff. And I was tattooing her and I was like, huh, <laughs> that's me. That's literally, you're talking about me. And she was like, Oh, and obviously I've been talking to her for a while at this point. And, you know, I tattooed her for six hours. So like we, we had a lot of conversation. And by the end of it, she was like, you really made me think about what this is, because you're clearly not the person that I was told you were. And and a lot of it, you know, like we certainly a big mistake we made was that we had this attitude that any publicity is good publicity. So when they were like writing these like sensationalist like absurdly sensationalist headlines about us being terrorists and and whatever else we were like okay well at least that will kind of maybe intimidate some companies out of dealing with Huntingdon which was all fun and games until we went to court and they started calling us terrorists in court um but it's kind of scary because a a lot of it is um with us I I will address your question directly in a minute but a lot of the stuff with us was um so so we we didn't as a campaign we didn't direct how people chose to act our only stipulation was that if it's unlawful it's not a shack action it might be the animal liberation from whatever but it's not a shack action so we we did ask our, our supporters and we we covered our website and newsletter and disclaimers like we are a lawful organization but we also allowed you know fairly confrontational tactics and 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 as long as it was in the law that that was fine um but the a big issue with us was that the police particularly and the media very much used this narrative of us trying to create a climate of fear and they they would perpetuate this stuff and actually they did more than we did of, of perpetuating this kind of climate of fear to companies so a lot of companies stopped dealing with hunting and life sciences because what the police told them not because what we did or or, or anything like that and um and yeah it, it was a double-edged sword and and where it really for me at least personally where it really has backfired for me in the long term is a big part of, of their strategy against us is when we went to court, no media came to the trial except for sentencing. So they obviously had the judge passing out these wildly like disproportionate sentences to people. And then the police gave the press a press release saying this because it was a conspiracy. None of us actually had to have done anything in the conspiracy. We just needed to be a party to it. And and so every horrible thing or some of them some of the, the actions that happened were horrible everything that had happened against this laboratory for the past 14 years was our fault uh according to this press release and if you actually read the articles that came out they will list these again horrible things that were never like i was never interviewed about these actions i was never uh it was never raised in court it was never raised in my pre-sentencing it was never raised until these press releases were given to the to the press um but you read these articles and it's like you know like bomb hoaxes and like infected sanitary towels sent to people and all these things that I, I was like this wasn't me like but you read the articles and it said these things happened and tom harris knew exactly what was going on there's like what does that mean it's like yes i knew there was a campaign and yes i knew some people stepped outside of the law but that wasn't me and that wasn't my campaign like that was other people and i, I can't be held responsible for that and Technically, you're not holding me responsible for that. You're just saying I was aware other things might be happening. And and that was very much like a very deliberate attempt to justify the the unjust sentencing and and also just to vilify us and separate us from the rest of the animal rights movement, but also human rights organizations that, you know, like Liberty wouldn't even talk to us when when these laws were brought out to try and stop us and stuff. They wouldn't even talk to us because of this very deliberate and manipulative um set up that the pharmaceutical industry and others had 
uh, and the police had kind of initiated. Um, so, so this these wacky actions justified, you know, me getting five years, my friend getting eleven years in prison. She she wasn't accused of any specific crime, just for organizing a campaign that she still believes is lawful. Um, and so, so as a hang up from that, if you now Google my name, um, which is fine if people choose to do that, the things you will read about me isn't anything I've actually done. But to this day, you know, like a while ago, I upset another tattoo artist over some trivial tattoo related thing and and he's tried to do this big smear campaign against me because of these articles and it's you know what i mean it's, it's still a part of my life and you know it's the reason i, I couldn't ever go to america and, and amongst many other things and yeah it's just it's very like bizarre that i don't know if bizarre is the right word like hurtful really that this very deliberate gaslighting and this very deliberate smear campaign is still there like i never lose that like the people that we protested against they can go back to their lives like there, there's no hang up that that's it but for me like for the rest of my life i will be tarnished with these things that had nothing to do with me or the people around me the campaign i was involved in and, and that yeah that's a hard thing i think your question was more specifically about how direct action impacts public perception of <coughs> campaigns and i i think it's a tough one and i think it's a hard thing for me. Like I, I have a personal policy where I won't criticize other people's activism. I think as long as it's not perpetuating oppression or perpetuating harm, I, I will support anyone's action. So I actually had an argument with a friend the other day about the Just Stop Oil protest at Wimbledon because um, she wanted to watch tennis and, and apparently disrupting tennis for a few minutes is worse than losing our entire planet to climate change. But yeah. Um, um, I mean, again, I, I'm not going to criticize them. And if they they have clearly thought through their strategy, and I'm sure they they have a very clear idea of what they're doing and, and reasons for doing it. And I'm sure a lot of groups like that these days do study data and research and, and come to, to very firm conclusions. But my personal, if I was pushed, my personal view was that we would be much better focusing that on politicians. I think if we made Rishi Sunak's life insufferable, we would see change far sooner than than if we make tennis insufferable. Um, tennis. How do we tennis. make Rishi Sunak's life insufferable? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm in. I, you know, suddenly my commitment to cause is. Uh, <laughs> I think. I mean, I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm reframing the the nonviolent thing. I, I know some people regard nonviolence as including not targeting individuals. Uh, that's not something I agree with. I, I think. I think if someone is doing something terrible, they deserve to be called out on it. I think in terms of animal liberation, I think the non-human animals don't get to clock off at five o'clock. So therefore the people that are condemning them to grotesque genocide, oppression, whatever, shouldn't get to clock off at five o'clock. In terms of Rishi Sunak particularly, like, again, he's a human being. He has hobbies. His children have hobbies. Like there, there are things he will do for fun that I personally, while he is instrumental in allowing our planet to die, I don't think he should be allowed to enjoy his hobbies without someone being there to remind him that he's doing something terrible. And uh, I think you know, there was one of the suffragettes, she, she followed uh, the Home Secretary with a bell and every time they spoke, they rang a bell. I think things, things like that, like you can make, he is an individual and he is a human being and as perverse as his thought processes may be, he does think and feel like we do. And and I, I think it's very easy to get under someone's skin. And I, I think that for me, that's where I'd like to see more stuff. I'm not doing it, so I'm not going to criticize anyone else for not doing it. But that is, ideally, that is what I, I think that would see change far quicker. The change might be a lot more laws that prevent you from harassing politicians. But, but I think we would see things start to shift if we made him have to listen to us because he doesn't care about us and he doesn't care about people watching I don't think. thank you very much tom you've been absolutely fantastic i've so so smart so deep thinking and um and also really like your tattoos and i'm i'm looking <laughs> at the moment so i didn't so to touch about that <laughs> great Thank you so much as well for your question. Uh, it's great to see everybody. And Tom, this has been just incredible. It really, it's um, 
I've learned so much and it's an honor to, to ch chat with you today. Uh, thank you so I much for it. sharing your time with us. Absolute pleasure to be here. Just thank you for having me. I've, I've enjoyed talking. Oh, absolutely. Um, Living One will be taking a brief hiatus now over the next month uh, before we begin our next series on contemplative activism this coming September. Uh, as always, if you enjoy Living One and you feel called to support Carulos, Living One, and all of our sanctuary residents, please consider donating at the link on our website, carulos.org. Uh, once again, everybody, to our lovely audience, thank you for joining us and for all of your insightful questions and Tom for sharing so much time with us today. It's really been just so great to talk with you and, and learn from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time.